Okay, so let's try to, uh, as we said before, <coughs> to apply these concepts uh, to the exercise of, uh, where is the web page, uh, of the question and answer website, okay? So we are starting from this page, that is the solution of the last week's exercise that we, we completed with all the CSS styles and whatever. This is just a static page. And uh, we want to make it dynamic uh, by a, sec a set of steps uh, that I try to su summarize in this uh, exercise text uh, here, where we want, uh, first of all, to uh, dynamically create the table. So uh, normally, the list of answers is dynamically defined. So we imagine that in, at some point we have a question object that contains a list of answer objects. And we want to generate the table starting from this information. So the HTML will contain an empty page. And then we, an empty table, sorry, an empty table. And then we populate the content of the table starting from some JavaScript uh, uh, data structure. Right now, the, the JavaScript data structure will be put inside the file, but uh, we can, of course, uh, later on, we will know, uh, uh, we'll understand how to, um, um, say, uh, read this information from a server, okay? So this is the, the first step. The second step will be to make the voting button work. And the third step is uh, making the addition of a new answer work in the table. I don't know uh, if we get to do everything in this uh, hour, but uh, otherwise we share the full uh, solution. Okay, so we are starting in the, this folder exercise six. Uh, I just made a copy of the solution of exercise four, which is, which is the full HTML. So we are starting from the same HTML with a simple page. And we create our own scripts, so just uh, create a script, uh, so JS file, where we put our code, okay? Use script, uh, and then we can write solution for exercise six. And we load this file from the HTML. So there we are all, all the CSS, all the stuff. And we add a script, defer source is script.js. And we can write our code. Um, we also need, uh, if we want to handle the Q&As, some code from last week, from the first week, when we had uh, uh, question and answer creator function. Okay? So if we go back in the weeks before we knew uh, the databases, maybe it was exercise four, no, you have a database already. Week two, exercise three, Q and A. We had this code where we define the answer and question um, creator functions that relied on a list of answers. So we didn't have any database yet. Okay, so we can go back and take this code and insert this code also because we need this. We don't want to re-implement everything insert this code also into our, into our web page. So let me copy this file and paste it into the exercise six folder. So into exercise six, I now have my script, new script, and the QA script that defines these functions. Of course, we need to remove all the stuff at the end that only keep the function definition. 
plus, okay, and so how do to load the QA and script? Okay, we just exploit the fact that every script will populate uh, the global uh, environment. And so we just call the script, uh, the different scripts in order, script, defer, source, QA. But yes. So I'm first loading all the content of QA and then my script so that my script can use the functions defined there. Defined there. <coughs> we have still detail. QA was using uh, the JS. And it was using a node specific syntax, the require. There is no require in the browser. But of course we need the uh, the DJS library to be loaded. So we need, uh, before loading QA, so uh, delete the defer statement, and they need to load the DJS from, well, either I make a copy, local copy, and then load it like QA from my project, or I can just download it from the source. Okay, so if I go to DJS.org, and go to the installation on the browser. It's telling me that I can download it from this uh, address. So instead of making a copy, I download it here and I always get the latest version. And this script can simply see here, I add the defer so that it will not block uh, the load. So I'm loading the libraries by hand, and then finally I'm loading my code, specific to the state. The browser will load them in order, will execute them, and so, yes? This link here is in the website of the AJS, of the library. So the library itself into the installation section, browser, so before we use the installation into Node.js, so we install with npm and load with require in Node. If we are in the browser, we need uh, to use a script tag to download the uh, code from, from the server. So there is no npm, there is no package manager in the browser. <coughs> okay. So this, I hope it works. Uh, if we reload this page, uh, let's keep the habit. Uh, I keep the habit of uh, always having the inspector open while I'm loading so that if any error or exception happens, uh, I will see the error in the console. Okay. Also, when I check your project, uh, uh, I always open the console and uh, if there are some exception or some syntax errors forgotten, the web page will, will not show it, uh, but the console will have the error. So also try to keep an habit of always having this console is your friend. Um, and I see that, uh, you know, the the JS has been loaded, also bootstrap, by the way, and uh, also my script, QA and script. They are all there. So the loading of the scripts uh, was successful. The browser can see all the code. Now I need to move uh, the creation of the table into some dynamic function. They should be executed just at the start up at that time, only when I first load the page, right? So uh, we just remove these lines from uh, uh, where is that? The, the table, the heading is okay, the rows of the body go away. Well, let's make a comment so that we can, and then we'll delete them later. So right now the page is empty. 
We have no row. We want to reconstruct them dynamically. So first of all, let's imagine we don't have a real database or real server to ask for this information. So let's just put them in line in our code. So let's create uh, uh, a question. A question. New question. Uh, the text, uh, let me copy it here. Well, the question is this one. Then the second parameter is the author, was Luigi. And then we have uh, the date, uh, maybe 2023, 1st of January, whatever. Then I can add some answers to that, okay? So my question dot add uh, what was the name sorry I remember add simply yeah dot add uh, a new answer with the text uh, let's copy from the HTML the first answer was uh, yes I look at score was minus 10 and uh, uh, the date was uh, 15 February 2023 February 15 let's add the second one this one both are browser calls Mario Rossi, what was the score? Zero. And the date was uh, March 4. Okay, so we should, I'm not interacting with the browser yet. I'm just preparing some data that, um, you know, in a real application should come from a server somewhere, okay? But right now I'm just, I need to create it somewhere, just for, te for testing purposes. So if I go to the browser, I reload the page. Okay, in the script I have this code. And uh, here you have the console, uh, the, the, the instruction console.log uh, of the my question and contains the object with, the, with all the information. So we have the answer array, it contains two objects. Okay, so we have the same, we reconstructed the JavaScript in the browser, the same kind of object we have in, in node in the first week. Okay. Just imagine these are just constants that you have in your code. What you want to do is to populate the web page with the results of this constant. And you can populate the web page only when the web page exists. So we need to put it into event, to an event handler that is firing when the page is created, like we did before. So this is just preparation. So let's say fake data. And then we can start the real wor work of the uh, document dot uh, add event listener for the DOM content loaded event. And all our code will go inside here. Uh, what can we do? Well, first of all, uh, the page contains also some information about uh, the question and the author of the question. So we should also remove this 
static text and uh, populate it from, from the question itself. And this is the easy part. And then the more complex part will be creating the table. So in the HTML, let's remove uh, the author name and remove the question name. So they, we, I have everything in the structure of the page without uh, the specific content. I, know I only need to inject the content in the, those locations. Okay. Uh, let's just check whether I have sufficient information for identifying exactly where I want to add the text. For example, this uh, is a p.lead. If I don't have any other element in the page with the class lead, it gives us that uh, this specific uh, text in uh, formatting in, in Bootstrap, we could use that. While the author is di more difficult to identify because it's in a span with a bunch of classes, uh, so uh, let's make ourselves, well, our life easier, just put an ID on that, author name. Question. Question author. Because we also have the author of the answers. And the, I'm marking uh, with this ID that this specific span that will contain the name of the author. So with this modification of the HTML, I can get, go to the script. Uh, right now the page will not contain the author and not contain the text. I'm adding them back dynamically. So the text of the question is in document query selector p.lead this will refer to the p node where the text of the question was okay let's put it an inner text Let's populate the inner text uh, with uh, my question dot text. So instead of making a const uh, variable and so on, we can just uh, mod take, take a reference to the node and modify its properties. So if I reload this page, the question appears, but this time it's dynamic. And the same for the for the author name, document dot get element by ID. Of course, if I have the ID, it will be faster, and the ID will be question author, question author dot inner text again is my question dot author. Yeah. So always like this. Find the node, modify it. In this case, modifying the by inserting some text because everything else was already ready. It was already set up with the proper formats and classes and so on. Now the interesting part is of course the tables. We need to add many rows, one for each answer. Okay, for answer, of answer, of my question dot uh, answer list. Yeah? Okay. For every answer, I need to add a new row to the table. Do we have this, a reference to a table? Oh, no, no, not yet. So let's first find a reference to the table. Uh, the table is, okay, is the only one, but may not always be the only one. In this. So maybe I mark it with an ID. Answer, answer 
table. So in my script, uh, I am the table is a document dot get element by ID answers table. Um, we need to, to create a row. And a row is made of TR element uh, with many TD elements as children. So it will be boring, but we need to build it one piece at a time. Like when you open the Lego instructions, you have many small bricks that need to fit together. So we can create a row. Let's call it TR as a document. Create element of type TR. Then we build the content of this row by creating some tables. Const uh, table data for the first column contains, uh, should contain the date. Document, create element of type TD. And this data should be populated with the actual data taken from the answer. So T data, T D data, dot inner text can be filled with the answer dot data dot format. We have the format uh, like uh, month, day, year, right? Date uh, is a DJS object, so we can apply format to convert it to a string. And finally, we can add to the row a new child made of this cells. And then we will repeat for different columns. Let's try to see something for starting to debug it. Uh, we should add the row at the end of the table. But not really at the end of the table because uh, we already have one, one final row here. So we can add it to the start of the table or let's just remember the table is composed of a table heading and a table body. So we had to add it as a child of the table body, not as a table heading. Uh, but we have still this line at the end that uh, is somewhat inconvenient because we want to, I would, we don't want to append after this form line. I, we want this form to be to, uh, still at the end. So there are many ways of doing that, but the easiest way is to remember that we also have uh, another section in the table. The table may have a heading, a body, and a footer. So. Let's make, let's make my life easier. Let's move these items into the footer. So that right now the table body really, the proper table body is empty and it's all mine to fill with. Hmm? And the table footer contains the form for adding the stuff. You see, we need to adapt in some way the HTML to make it easier for working with JavaScript. We could also do with the HTML without modifying it, but it would be more cumbersome in JavaScript, so we need to find the last row and then the sibling before it. Uh, it's not impossible, there's more code. So in this case, it's easier because we can just append the row at the end of the table body. So we can have a table dot uh, a query selector 
Okay, the body is probably the second child uh, of the table. So we could, sorry, let us let me make some examples. Const table body is uh, the second children of the table because table, t head, t body, t row, t foot. So it should probably be something like table dot uh, uh, children, child nodes, sorry, or one. Maybe. But maybe not because maybe there are some spaces between table and TD, T head, and uh, between T head. So does, do the spaces count as children? In some cases they do, in some cases they don't. So it's always dangerous uh, counting children like this. Also, if we if something is shuffled around, uh, so I I would prefer a bit more robust way of, of identifying the table body. And of course, we have the squeeze selector for doing that, or the const table body is a table dot query selector. T body. And this will find the T body element inside the table. I'm not querying from documents, so I, all the table bodies of all the, ta of the, the pages in the document. Only the body of this specific table. Oh, by the way, I just see that this is invariant to the loop, so I could also move it outside the for loop. Okay. I don't need to recompute it every time. I find the table and I find its body. And then the real point is uh, when I append it to the table body, a new child. Add the, uh, append child of this row. So finding the table body in a more, the simplest and more robust way that we can think of, and uh, changing the table body, in this case, by appending new content. For appending this content, first I have to build this uh, according to the HTML nesting rules. And this should, yeah, populate the table body with two new rows that only contain one cell, I need, we need to finish all the table. Okay, let's go for it. Another possibility, okay, the second one would be the name of the author, no, the text of the question. So it would be TD text. We create another TD, TD text, TD text. And the answer dot text. And we have it. So we prepare the different children. We have to create many elements, okay? Uh, separate ones. We, we cannot just uh, reuse the same TD that we created before because it's a separate node that needs to have its own properties. Otherwise, we, have that, we, have, we cannot have two children pointing to the same element. It must be a tree of separate nodes, okay? Uh, then we have uh, the author, td of the author. And finally, the score. Yep.
And this are, it's easy because they're, oh, it's boring, of course, but it's easy because we just have text inside this CD. In the last column, it's a bit more complex because we have a button to create. So the CD will contain a button with the proper classes to be styled and so on. Okay. So at the end of each row, we also have a, a further CD with a button. If again, uh, you cannot just add the document document dot dot create element. Another CD, the last one. <coughs> And inside of this, we must uh, put a button, the vote button, const, which is another element, it's not just text, okay? Const, uh, vote button, is another document, dot create element of a button. The button itself contains the word vote. So vote button dot inner HTML, it's inner text, sorry, contains a vote. And then I add the button to the TD, I add the TD to the, to the, to the row. TD button. Add child. Append child, sorry. The vote button. And uh, here row, append child, table data with the button. And uh, this button should be here. Uh, they appear as default buttons. We need to style them with Bootstrap. Okay, they were button info, so we, we need to add some classes to them. So what button dot uh, class list dot add. We add the uh, class button and the uh, button info to make them blue. They're styled in shape, size, and color by Bootstrap. Of course, they still don't do anything, but that, that we can solve. It's very low level, okay? And we, I always have the console open, we have no errors, hopefully. <coughs> There's another way, maybe faster way, for doing this construction of nodes, is to um, exploit the fact that the browser already has an HTML parser. So we can give an HTML fragment and let the browser convert that fragment into nodes. For example, uh, I have the TD button. I could use the attribute uh, inner HTML. So the TD button is the last cell, or the TD for the last column. I'm not just putting some text inside. I'm putting some HTML fragment. And so the browser will read the HTML fragment and create the nodes for me. And this case would be, uh, I write HTML here, button, class, uh, equal to button, uh, button info, and then uh, uh, vote, and then a close the button. Make an 
alternative here. So inner HTML takes a string and parses that into HTML and appends the nodes corresponding to that. So I don't tell to create the vote button. Instead, the, in this case, we only have one node, so more or less. But maybe it's easier from the syntax point of view. And this should work. Uh, let me try. Let me check. Yeah. This works in the same way. Yes? Yes, any, any HTML fragment. So you can have uh, something, uh, um, maybe I can add, I don't know, a text like press here. And it will create something like this. And from the inspector point of view, they are two nodes, one text and one button. They're two children. You will create anything. We could also create a, a full row if we want. Instead of creating one by one all the cells, when I created the element row, I could have just said uh, er.inHTML equal to just a template string with the content, td slash td, and inside we have the date, dollar uh, answer dot date. And then another td slash td, of course, I have to have the syntax right hmm? uh, with the dot spec. So all of this, let me just try to comment it out. Of course, it's, it's incomplete, but it's say, okay. Inside this row, I have some complex HTML. Create the nodes and put them inside. And it, yeah, it works. In, okay, I didn't call format and so on, but uh, you get the idea. So we, uh, we can create one node at a time and add in the properties, the classes, and so on. Or we can have a string and let the browser parse it and create node itself. Depends, of course, on the cases on what control do we want to have over the, over the nodes. Because in in the other case, in this case, we, ha we ha already have the variables that represent all these nodes. So we can do add listeners, for example, or add other information to these nodes. In this case, we have just uh, it's easier, it's faster to write. And uh, so it's your choice. Let's keep this the long way. And also here. But there's nothing wrong with the, uh, the uh, all these other alternatives. OK, so we could recreate uh, all the page. <coughs> Sorry, I didn't save it. All the page starting from some dynamic information. Now vote. How can we add a vote? We need to add an event listener to the uh, click event on this button. OK, we can do that. Uh, well, we can do that when we create the button, for example. Or even later. Re remember, we are inside the DOM content loaded event. Okay. So I, all of this happens when we create the table, when we open the page. So this vote button, uh, we can set an event handler for the click event. I already have the vote button variable, not the, ta don't the, TV, not the table data, but the button itself, uh, add event listener of click event. Body. Yes. No, you can 
the node is there, you can modify it anytime. So it, uh, once the, the child is appended, it's still your, yeah, you could also, for example, this append child could also be done before. Here, just after creation, it's not a problem. And then you set the properties of a node that is already inserted, but it's just uh, uh, By the way, remember, everything here is synchronous. So we are creating a lot of, uh, we will never see the table that will be created one uh, row by row. The browser does not stop, does not update instruction after instruction. The browser is waiting for this procedure to finish. Remember the call stack. As long as we are executing code, the browser is waiting. So the browser will refresh the page once uh, with a full table. Okay, so it's not a, it, we don't care about the order in which we add information. The only the final result of the DOM when we finish our procedure will be processed by the browser. Hmm? If we want the table to appear one row at a time, we need to schedule separate events with some delay, okay? An animation. Hmm? But here everything will be executed up to the end and then the browser will be rendered. So it's not a problem of it's a node, and this node can be modified at any time. Okay, uh, what do we do when the, bus, when the user clicks on the button? We need to increase a score. Which score? Well, the score in the same line of this button. We have many options here. One option is uh, uh, to regenerate the row, maybe. We have uh, here, we still have the reference to the answer option. Remember closure. I can let this particular event tender to remember the answer object that I used to create the row. So the old core It's easy to get answer dot score. Well, maybe not, but and we can update the score. Do we have a method? Uh, did we have already a method? Uh, no, not in this implementation. Not in this call. Okay. So if I want, I can still access all the information. And then regenerate some TD or we change some in HTML and so on. Or we can just work with, we, what, with what we have in the page. Okay? Remember, this is a, we can use closures. So every, for every button, we have a different function, a different callback function. They will be the same, fun, they will be copies of the same function, but with different closures because we are inside an iteration where we remember different values of this iteration variable. But even if we don't have this, we can just work with what, is, what we have on the page. We have two choices here. We update the JavaScript variables uh, and then we recreate the DOM, or we just forget about the JavaScript variables and we work with what we have on the page. What are pros and cons? Uh, let's uh, think we work, uh, or we, but in any case, the problem is that uh, we need to change this or that cell, the right cell, in the right row. And how can I know the right row, the right cell? There are two ways. One is I remember it. I just created it, to this score. So I can create a callback that know exactly which cell to modify. So the old score, uh, old score would be the uh, td score dot inner text. We read it. Maybe we convert it to a number because it would be a string. Then we increase it, new score be old score plus one 
and then we write it cd4 dot uh, inner text would be the new score of course I can write everything into one line okay just to show what I already have the reference to a node that I need to modify it's read or modify this is my best case I already know the node so I click here I click there every button as a copy of the callback with a different closure onto the CD score cell. Of course, if I reload the page, well, I'm restarting. Okay. So it's not, I'm not storing this value anywhere. Okay, because I was, at, I was uh, lucky that I already, I already had a, a variable pointing to the node corresponding to the same button. Imagine that we want to add these event listeners in, in another part of the code. So we create a table and then in one function, and in another function we set the event listener. It can be done. We could also work in a different way. Uh, the button, so the score to be modified is the table data in the same row as the button itself. So I could navigate the DOM from the button to its father, the row, to its children, the cells. This is another way okay, of getting the cell. So imagine we don't have the CD score reference anymore. What we could do is try, okay, I am the button. What gives me the information about uh, the node uh, that generated the event? Event.target. Event.target is always pointing to the node, to the source of the event. Now, the name is particularly uh, strange because the event.target is the source of the event. Target being source. They have something strange in mind. So in this case, even the target is the node, the button. Cost the button. Forget that I already have it, not button here, okay? We are just imagining that we are outside of this function. We don't have any of the reference before. And uh, I can go up to the parent uh, parent node right let me sorry I have that nice picture in the slide with all the movements yeah parent node so from the button if I go to the parent node of the button, what do I get? The CD. And so if I go to the parent node of the parent node, I should get a row. This is the row. And then I need to get the, sorry, where is the HTML? One, two, three, fourth column. Four children, or sorry, four child of the row. So it should be child nodes uh, index three. This should be the four cells. Probably. It's very fragile, okay? If we change anything, that it will not, we won't go. It, if we, any, we are adding a column somewhere or reordering the column, this breaks up. That's why having references and making closures is a safer way. But we cannot always do that. 
the document get elements uh, by ID or good query selector don't help us here because uh, we want the specific row in which we are the, uh, the button was pressed. So the only information we have is the button itself. We need to reconstruct. Okay. Uh, and then uh, at this point we uh, may say that score cell dot inner text uh, is uh, number of score cell dot inner text plus one. Probably. Try, I'm not so sure, but yeah, it works. So this is what the uh, um, DOM navigation methods are for. You, are, you, are, you have a reference to one node, but you need to query or to modify something nearby. Of course, when you are navigating the DOM, you must be very, very sure of the structure of the page. In this case, I'm quite confident uh, of taking the third child, the fourth, or the fourth child, because I built these children myself. I'm sure that there are no spaces in between, or no new lines or other stuff. They, are, they were not there in the page originally. I created these roles. I created these children. But, but the, the basic idea is that to show you the usage of event.target. Okay. When I have uh, only one event uh, or only one element in the page, there's no confusion. But when the same event can be generated, like in this case in a table, I have 27 buttons, they all call the same callback, then that function should be able to understand uh, which of the, of the 10 or 12 buttons was, was called. And then, of course, modify differently. I can do that by navigating the HTML. I can do that by remember by doing closure over some DOM cells, uh, or by doing closure over the data, the answer object. Another possibility that we will, when we do React, uh, we will use this last possibility. We modify the data structure and let and regenerate everything, and regenerate the table, so that the source of information will always be our data, and then the HTML page will just follow, and seems slower but still in some sense. Hmm? So, different ways. Um, just remember that we are inside a callback that is scheduled on the click event, and the scheduling happens only in the callback of the DOM content, content loader. So we are, we should be very you know, uh, careful about creating all these nested structures. If you are nesting too much, maybe it's better to write a function and then set the callback by, by function name if, if you don't need the closure. Okay, so we might uh, also try the last point, adding a new row. It means that when the user clicks uh, on this add button, we take the, value that are, the values that are here, but maybe accept the score. But we should not be able to set the score for our own answer. Okay, let's start from zero and then put it in the table. So we, what do we do? Well, it's easy. We just need to set an event tender on this button and pick the values and so on. So uh, the button is uh, here. Button class uh, success uh, add, uh, mm, okay. Let's add an ID. Add button. And let's remove this input with the, with the score. So I'm removing this cell here. I keep in the table data to keep something aligned, but the table will be empty. The, the, the cell will be empty. So what do we do? We uh, 
chain at the end here. So we had all the code for populating the table. Okay, and then we add another element sender to the button. So query select document. Where is the button? Query selector of button ID add button or just add button. Okay. I'm using query selector with an ID is the same. Just remember to use the syntax. And we add an event add an event listener for the click event to this button. And we need to extract the information from the different fields. Uh, how do we find the fields? Well, maybe we can add a name attribute, which is a normal input element. Usually, you have a name attribute that defines the, the, the variable name, basically. The name could be date. The first one. The second one is uh, name equal to uh text and the third is the author i could also set an id but usually for input elements uh, the name attribute is already defined it should be so we are using something that is used anyway and so we can extract the information from the javascript Const uh, the name, so the date is uh, document dot uh, query selector, and I want to query for an input element with the attribute name equal to date. This one syn one, uh, one possible syntax for CSS, the square brackets. Uh, select uh, on the basis of an, of an attribute. So the input elements that have the name attribute defined to date. I'm not sure if I need uh, some quotes, but just in case. This is the input element. The value itself uh, should be inside the property called value. Or text, or not value. I don't remember. Let's see in a moment. And uh, the other one is uh, the author, for example, or the text. Uh, let me set, oh, sorry. I, I'm not sure about to get the the value, so let me just go into the debugger for a moment. Okay. So let's uh, put a breakpoint uh, here and click on add. Okay, so I'm here. If I step one instruction, I have this date variable that represents the this input element this is the node the HTML node what I want is the content that the user type or selected inside the node and this content will be in a property I'm not sure which is called value let's go to the end value value yeah value let's go If I select a date and I, I click on the button again, you see that the date value attribute is changed. OK, 
Okay, so value is the attribute that in all the input elements contains the currently input value. So the date value. 